OK, uh, I'm going to talk about how we change the web. Um, that's my job at Mozilla, is to change the web. And uh, forgive me if this talk gets a little philosophical. Uh, hopefully, things will get more juicy and technical as the day goes on. Um, in fact, I'm probably the most awake person here. My body thinks it's like 4 or 5 in the afternoon. So um, you can all sleep through this if you don't like philosophy. All right. so. Uh, Whenever people talk about changing technology, you, can, you, you see them start to divide into two different camps. There's the revolution style and the evolution style. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I'm not going to try to convince you that one is right or wrong, but I do want to convince you that evolution works remarkably well. And sometimes when you think it's time for a revolution, maybe you should stop and think, would evolution work better? So again, I'm not, I'm not uh, anti-revolution here. In fact, uh, the organization that I work for, Mozilla, was actually founded on a kind of revolution. And I think at this, it's, uh, in 2014, it's been long enough that a lot of people don't actually know the sort of creation story of Mozilla. Uh, I was pretty young when this happened. I think I was in my early 20s. I'm betting a lot of you were even younger than that. Um, so it's a really fascinating story. Uh, back then, Netscape and Microsoft were the two dominant browser, or, you know, the two companies with the dominant browsers, Netscape Communicator, I think it was called at the time, and Internet Explorer. And Netscape was doomed. Uh, Internet Explorer had undercut their business model, and they suddenly found themselves a company with no source of revenue. Uh, and they knew this. This was not, they weren't fooling themselves into thinking that they had some, some way to survive. Um, so they could see that Microsoft was really poised to basically take over the web. And uh, in this kind of desperate situation, they actually pulled uh, a pretty amazing move, uh, particularly for that time when open source was not as, um, as, as popular or common a thing. Uh, on the 31st of March in 1998, they decided to open the source to Netscape and create Mozilla.org, which was going to be this worldwide organization of uh, open source collaborators. Um, now, this was really sort of a, there was a kind of two parts to the, to what makes this a revolution. One was this was maybe possibly going to rescue Netscape from almost certain death. Uh, and we know how that story ends. Um, but more importantly, I think this move saved the web. I think if they hadn't done this, there would have been very little, uh, that anybody could do to stop Microsoft from, from taking over the web. Um, as it turns out, this revolution was actually televised. Uh, so I have a, a, a little clip here I want to show you from a documentary called Code Rush, which was actually, they followed Netscape people around um, during this period, and they actually filmed the moment when Jamie Zawinski, who was a, a well-known developer at Netscape, pushed the code out to the web. And for me, this is a pretty heady moment in the history of the web. This was, this was a moment of revolution. Um, and what led up to this was a whole bunch of pressure. They were uh, behind schedule. They were finding out at the last minute that they had potentially patent-encumbered code that they were going to have to replace. And there were people pulling all-nighters to replace patent-encumbered code with open source code. So it was really down to the wire. And the documentary kind of plays that up. So here they are on March 31st. That's American style. Sorry. One way to learn to run a marathon is put a person out 26 miles into the desert and say, you know, that there's this bomb on your back that's going to go off in a certain length of time if you don't get into the town. Well, that'll motivate you to get in, but there's a certain chance that you'll be blown up. What time is it? Yeah, it's uh, 5.55. Five five minutes. So. Going to be late. Hurry up. That's Welcome, Jamie everybody, Zawinski to the conference call. Thanks for joining us this morning. Today, uh, Netscape announced that the first developer release of its Communicator 5.0 source code is available for download from the Mo Mozilla.org website. And you know where Tara is. That's right. It's go. second floor? Yeah, it's or the first floor, um, like way on the other side. And then today, on the end of March, as we announced, we are pushing the code out to the web, as they say, and we're delighted to be part of it, and we're very excited to see what happens. The good news is the marathoner is now coming into town with that bomb on his back, and it looks like he's going to make it. This is the moment of truth. They don't have a theoretical framework to write software. They're just writing it. Hi. Here we go. 
It's just like hitting the baseball. If their code gets a home run, nobody's asking questions. Well, this doesn't make sense, or why do you do that? Why does it work? Nobody cares why it works. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Wait, this is bad. Here we go. What's that? <laughs> um, well, it's not connected to the the, uh, the machine that, that controls the FTP push is like not answering. Is it loaded? It's, it's blast, uh, not uh, blash. Oh, so, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Good read not to. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, that bin, yeah. Duh. Duh. Okay. We're okay. Up. Yay! It's soup. Max there. Phoenix is there. Windows is there. <laughs> We're done. We're done. It's up. We're done. <laughs> Here, I'm told that means that we have now pushed the source out on the net. Is that correct? Yeah. Actually, yeah. we decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> Any fun? It, it, it was just a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's our story, and we're sticking to it. For a moment, everyone at Netscape takes a breather. I think it's going to work out. He said, I think it's going to work out there at the end. I think my favorite part of that is the little Duran Duran playing in the background. All right, this was, a, this was uh, a seriously revolutionary move, and they knew what they were doing. This wasn't just about saving Netscape. They understood that uh, they were also creating a parachute to, to rescue uh, competition on the web, to be able to have uh, another, uh, another option after the end of Netscape. So Jamie Zawinski was replying a year later after AOL had acquired Netscape and people were kind of uh, face palming and, and, and giving up. And he was saying, don't, rem don't forget what we did uh, because we uh, opened the, the, the source code, because legally Nobody can close that source code back up. He's saying nobody can undo what has been done. The Mozilla code is out there, and nobody can ever take that away from you, ever. So the, you know, it took a couple of years for that source code to really land on its feet and for Firefox to become a big thing. But this was a big, uh, a big bold move in the history of, um, of the web. So revolution is really exciting, and it lets you raise guns over your head and, and, and red flags. And it's, it's pretty hard to get excited about things like evolution, because evolution tends to not be quite as pretty, not, maybe not quite as exciting. Um, it, it produces some interesting uh, effects. But I'm going to try anyway to convince you that there's, uh, there's, there's times for revolution, but there's also times when maybe revolution isn't what's called for, and maybe evolution would actually work better. So, you know, when they saw we're, we're at death's door here, the web is almost over, OK, that's time for revolution. Um, but often you hear people say, you know, you read on like Hacker News, oh, this, you know, JavaScript's such an ugly language. Oh, it has width. We should just start over again. Um, but look, every technology has warts, and maybe having warts isn't actually enough cause for revolution. So one of the, uh, one of the topics where you see people asking for revolution all the time is this, you know, why don't you have a bytecode language on the web? And for a long time, Mozilla argued against uh, trying to standardize uh, a bytecode VM. But it was hard to really, uh, it's hard to just say no. You, you really want to offer an alternative. And so um, when we look at the, the, the calls for a bytecode language, it's actually better to, to take a step back and say, well, what are the problems that people are actually trying to solve? The problems that, that they're identifying, these are real actual problems, are things like JavaScript lacks uh, the features that you need for other languages to compile to the web. So if you want the web to be a compile target for some other language, if you want to be able to port some other code to the web, there are some features missing in JavaScript that make that difficult. Uh, another one is, is performance. You know, JavaScript historically has been slow, or maybe it's not always slow. Sometimes it's fast, but it's very hard to predict when it's going to be fast because JITs are extremely dynamic, heuristic systems. It's very hard to get repeatable, repeatable reliable performance. It's hard to get reliable performance across multiple browsers. Um, and for people who really wanted to squeeze out maximum performance, particularly the games industry, uh, JIT compilation can also provide, uh, produce performance problems of its own. Uh, just the act of compiling code can itself introduce jank 
uh, in, your, in your code. So these were all real issues, but instead of just saying, well, let's start from scratch and let's you know, uh, create a new standards body and try to get all the companies together and, uh, and uh, come up with something out of whole cloth, we decided to, to take a different approach uh, at Mozilla. So the first step was, well, we know that we can compile to JavaScript. There's lots of languages that compile to JavaScript. Let's try compiling high performance programs to JavaScript and see how well we can do. So my colleague, Alon Zakai, created the mscripten compiler. Um, this was sort of the first step of our process. Uh, it was just to say, OK, it's probably impossible to compile. This is actually what he told me. He said he was sure that this was impossible uh, to compile C++ to JavaScript. But he might as well give it a try and see where it falls down. Um, and he, along with everyone else, was shocked to see that it worked better than he expected. Um, and he was able to leverage a lot of the hard work of the LLVM tool chain. So he didn't have to write a lot of the back end code. Um, but even so, it was a pretty amazing feat to take a low level language and compile it to JavaScript. Um, the next step was to figure out, well, how can we get better performance out of this? So he's built this compiler that produces JavaScript. Now we look, need to look at our JavaScript engine and figure out, well, what kinds of performance bottlenecks are we hitting there? How can we optimize our JavaScript engine? It turns out that he wasn't the only one doing this. There were other uh, compilers being used on the web. And so multiple engines were actually starting to uh, multiple JavaScript engines were starting to improve the performance for this sort of strange style of code that was being generated by compilers. Um, and so over time, we were closing those performance gaps. And then the final step was when we got together, uh, Alon Zakai, uh, Luke Wagner, another colleague of mine and I got together and said, can we actually uh, formalize what this dialect of JavaScript is that we're generating from the Emscripten compiler in a way that we could actually recognize that code ahead of time in our JavaScript engine, validate it, and actually prove that we can get a higher degree of optimizations that are guaranteed to be correct. Um, so basically, it was, can we lock in that, that last level of performance? Um, and this worked really well. And it also uh, turned a lot of stomachs. So uh, you know, I showed you the, those pictures of evolution. Evolution doesn't always pr provide the, the prettiest results. So one of the, one of the things that bothers people about ASM.js is that it's this very bizarre style of code. Um, so, you know, I could, I could def defend myself and say, well, you know, any machine generated code is ugly. You, you know, you can look at any bytecode language and it's going to look just as ugly. But that's really not the point. The point here is that this is an evolutionary strategy where a bytecode language has to get over this initial hump that's very difficult, which is that no content authors, nobody who's actually building web apps could start to use a new bytecode language until enough browsers had actually implemented that bytecode language and it had reached enough uh, end users. And this creates a kind of chicken and egg problem where developers aren't creating demand because they're not building it, so browser vendors aren't, don't have the incentive to build it, and so browser vendors aren't building it, which means that developers aren't using it. It's very hard to get off the ground. Whereas with ASM.js, what we did was we said, well, this is just JavaScript. This actually works in any uh, JavaScript engine as long as it has typed array support, and typed arrays are, you know, had long been standardized. So from the get-go, ASM.js worked in multiple browsers. Once IE10 added uh, typed array support, it started working in IE as well. So you can write ASM.js code that works in IE, Safari, Opera, Chrome, Firefox. Um, so this was a technology that could work from the start, and it was one that web developers could start using. And that meant that we could bootstrap this evolutionary process and actually get things moving faster. So just to prove that this is real, and because I love to show off my colleagues' work, I'm going to do just one ASM.js demo. So what this demo is is the, um, uh, the AAA game company Epic. They do some of the sort of Hollywood blockbuster style games. Uh, their latest engine is called Unreal Engine 4. This is a port, let's see. Oh, this isn't fitting on the screen, here we go. So this is a port of a demo of Unreal Engine 4 running with no plugins in uh, a nightly build of Firefox. Uh, I don't know how many lines of C++ code it is, but I think it's at least a, a million lines. It's about a 68 megabyte payload. You can see there's some 
pretty nice lighting effects. This is actually not even finished. So Unreal 4 is not, I think it hasn't even been released, or maybe it's just in the process of being released. So when we first uh, met with Unreal, or with Epic, uh, to help them port Unreal 3 a year ago, uh, they got it working in less than a week. Um, so we're proving that it's actually possible to compile high performance JavaScript code, or high performance native code to the web. Um, Mostly push button, and that's getting better and better. Uh, but at this point now, they're taking products they haven't even released yet. So let's see if we can go to some fun. I like this demo because I'm not a big gamer, and I like the atmosphere of it. It's not as violent. So we have other partners, too. Um, the other really big name, uh, here's the city. The other really big name in um, game engines is Unity. And we just announced with them at the Game Developers Conference that uh, the Unity engine has also been ported to Asm.js. Somewhere there's like a big thing that takes me and flies me away. I don't know. Like I say, I'm not much of a game, per game player, but anyway, so there's a taste of native code running in the browser with no plugins. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, a sort of uh, mini movement that we started calling one JavaScript or one JS. Uh, my nanny tells me that my infant daughter really loves One Direction, so. I don't think I could name their songs if I heard them. Um, so when I first got involved with uh, TC39, the standards committee, um, they were in the process of doing edition four of ECMAScript. And um, let me kind of get you into the heads of people who do standards. People who do standards have to con cope every day with the mistakes that were made in the past in a technology. And they desperately wish that they could fix them. And the web is enormous, and you can't take anything back. And so when you're looking at you know, billions of, of uh, applications that are all using these broken features, and you really wish you could get rid of the features, but you can't do it without breaking them, there's this enormous temptation to say, let's, let's create a clean slate by having a, some sort of opt-in where you can choose a new version of the language. And there we can actually throw away some features that we never liked or that get in the way or cause problems for other features that we want. So when I first joined, that was the plan of action. That was the plan of record for edition four. We were going to have this new MIME type application slash JavaScript semicolon version equals four, and that was going to be this grand new utopia that everyone was going to program in. Um, I, I say I have to get you in the mind of a standards person because any developer looks at this and thinks that they're out of their minds. Um, but when you really, really wish that you could change the technology, it's very natural to want to do that. So the kinds of things that we were talking about doing back then were we wanted to introduce these generator functions. And at the time, the, the problem we were running into was they needed this new yield keyword, but yield wasn't a reserved word. And there's actual code out there on the web that uses yield as an identifier. So this was just an incompatibility. How could we do this? And the easy answer was, well, we'll just force them to opt into the new language. And then with the new language, we can reserve new keywords. So edition four got canceled for all sorts of various reasons. Um, if, uh, if you want to hear the story, you're going to have to get me a beer. But um, even though that got canceled, then when we moved on uh, to edition five did a few things. But then when we moved on to edition six, we kind of went back to the same plan again. We were, we were going to have this version opt in, and we were going to be able to break things. And so we were going to be able to have generator functions that, that had this reserved key keyword yield. And that was the plan for a long time, and it was allowing us to think big thoughts about you know, really breaking compatibility and changing things and doing things in new ways. And one day, uh, my colleague Sam tobin Hoxtet, who's a professor at uh, Indiana University back in the States, um, he and I were IMing, and he said, you know, I just had this nagging feeling in the back of my head that maybe we, we we're so close to compatibility with the existing versions of JavaScript, maybe we actually don't need the opt-in. And that was like this big you know, being slapped by a two by four over the head. It had just never occurred to me before that, that we should reconsider that. So we worked through it and we realized we can do everything we're trying to do without actually needing an opt-in. So for generators, for example, um, by giving a special 
distinct syntax for what a generator function looks like, that allows us to uh, contextually reserve the keyword yield. Basically, there are sort of feature by feature, um, you could call them hacks or you could call them finesses. Um, <laughs> so this allows us to add new features to JavaScript in such a way that you don't have to decide, I'm going all in for the new language version if I just want this one feature. And that's really critical for the evolution story. For people to be able to piece by piece adopt new technology, they need to not have to worry about, if I pull in this one piece, am I going to pull in all these other pieces as well? Is that going to break other parts of my code that already exist? Can I just, you know, can I just adopt one piece at a time? And the easier you make it for people to adopt one piece at a time, the faster you get to turn that evolutionary crank. So I sent an email to the mailing list called ES6 Doesn't Need Opt-in, and I, and I coined this slogan, just one JavaScript. And that has become a sort of um, a, a guiding principle for us all along, is let's not fork the language. Let's keep within one language and add new features uh, piece by piece rather than trying to um, create whole new versions of JavaScript. So this is important for several reasons. It, it, it helps focus our work. It prevents us from um, uh, going off in directions that are just kind of pointless anyway. Uh, it enforces consistency. The more we fork the language, the more we have, to, the more developers have to deal with. Well, what happens if I have ES5 code and ES6 code, and they need to interact with each other? Um, and like I said, it helps adoption because it allows people to pick off uh, features one at a time. And of course, when you're talking about language features. Uh, they can't just use them like libraries and use standard polyfills like they can with APIs. Then they need to use things like compilers. But that's a real thing now. Compilers aren't just a, um, a, a theoretical possibility. They're, they're a standard tool these days for JavaScript development. So in between ES4 and ES6, there was actually another little mode that gets snuck in there, uh, and that was strict mode. And uh, I, I'm not going to get into the vagaries of you know, what's good and what's bad about strict mode, except just to say that it's once again another opt-in mode. And it is another kind of forking of the language. And again, it was one of those things where it was very tempting for people on a standards committee to use, because there are all these pain points. So one of the main ones is function declarations inside of a block uh, have just completely incompatible semantics across different browsers. They were actually never part of the ECMAScript standard, and so each browser added it in a non-standard way. And they have some parts that have overlapping semantics and some parts that are incompatible. And so it was just hopeless. Every time we tried to figure out how can we actually standardize what the behavior should be, it, it was impossible to find something that worked on all browsers and that wouldn't break existing content. So strict mode gave us an in for doing that. We could say, ah, well, for new code that opts into strict mode, we can fix the semantics, we can make it clean, we can make it what we, what we want it to be. But the problem is, again, you're forcing people to opt into this new mode. Um, strict mode had some, some issues of its own uh, as far as like you know how to mash together non-strict code and, and strict code. So in ECMAScript 6, what we're doing is instead of an opt-in mode, we're tying strict mode to modules. Now, modules aren't tied to a whole bunch of different things. This is the one piece that's tied together. But I think it's really important. So for one, I think Node has proved to us that people want to write their code in modules. That's the style that people want to write programs in. So I think that once modules start landing in all of the browsers, or even once the uh, compilers that people are building today start becoming prevalent enough, people are really going to want to use ECMAScript 6 modules for writing their code. And just by using a module, you'll automatically be put into strict mode. And that means some of those cleanups that we got to introduce into the language for strict mode will now just be applied everywhere. And some of the worst mistakes of JavaScript's past will sort of be automatically fixed for the vast majority of code that you write, as long as as long as you want to be using modules, which I think, again, is, is going to be popular. So this is a one-time fix. We don't get to do this all the time. But modules were an opportunity, and they were op an opportunity to do this in a way that didn't force people to use that, that language forking. So the, the, the basic theme here is that features are better than forks. Introducing fixes to the language on a case-by-case -case basis works much better than forcing programmers to deal with sort of a combinatorial explosion of different versions of ECMAScript. Uh, and modules are just a better tool to use for opting into strict mode than modes. And it's my hope that in the future, people aren't going to really think about strict mode anymore. It's just going to be, well, there's some old code that's kind of sloppy in this, what we call sloppy mode. But, um, but the vast majority of code will be in modules, and they'll, aut they'll aut automatically be strict. 
OK, so the last thing I want to talk about is hermeneutics. Uh, this is no relation to my name. It's named after uh, the, the Greek god Hermes. So hermeneutics is um, uh, the philosophy of interpretation. It's uh, particularly it was invented for understanding, for, for talking about how do we understand texts. And in the early days, it was all about religious texts. Um, and in particular, there's this idea uh, that was introduced, I think, in the 20th century by Heidegger and then some, uh, some later uh, philosophers like uh, Gadamer and Max Weber uh, built on the idea called the hermeneutic circle. So the idea of the hermeneutic circle, uh, you know, again, this stuff started out with textual interpretation, but over time it started to be applied to how do we understand things in general. And the idea was that if you're reading a book, to understand the book you have to read the individual parts. Uh, but then once you've read all of those individual parts, you kind of get an understanding of the whole, and you can start to interpret the whole book. But once you've got this better interpretation of the book, that would actually color how you read the parts. So you could go back and reread the book again and refine your understanding of the book. And you can kind of go around and around in the circle and iteratively deepen your understanding of the text. So this idea, I think, is very intuitive for us because we're used to iterative processes in software. Um, and in particular, when it comes to designing web technology, uh, there, there's kind of an analog of that big picture, small, small picture, that micro and macro. The macro is that good design has to be motivated by end-to-end -end use cases and workflows. We have to think about what does the, the whole system look like? What does the development model look like? Does this language feel good to, to program in? Uh, what does a normal program look like? Um, but in order to actually build that programming model, you have to design the individual pieces. And anyone who's spent time working in design learns that just like software, you want to build things in small modular pieces, little orthogonal composable pieces that you can fit together. So if you take feature A and feature B and you put them together, you don't get something uh, unexpected. They just work uh, as the, the sort of expected combination of A and B. So, in the design process, we can really go through that same hermeneutic circle. You do design of the individual pieces for a while, and then you have to evaluate the big picture. And you have to go around the block multiple times. I think this is just a feature of any learning process, is that you're going to get it wrong in the beginning. You're going to have to learn to throw some parts away. Um, and we understand this in software completely. We talk about you know, plan to throw one away. We talk about move fast and break things. We're all used to the idea of, uh, of changing our minds as we deepen our understanding of things. Um, so when you're developing a product, we kind of have a pretty good handle on this. You sort of have this iterative process where we develop the product for a while, we ship it, we get some user feedback, we evaluate it, and invariably it's not perfect, and we go back around the block again, and, and we refine our product. But what happens when you try to do this with a standard? There's a major problem. You develop the standard for a while, you ship it, you evaluate it, you get some developer feedback, but now it's out there on the web, and you'll break user content if you change it, and you can't break the web, and you're stuck. You go one time around the block, and you can never change it again. This is just a broken way for us to evolve the web, because none of us is going to get it right the first time. We're just not good enough. So this is where this movement called the Extensible Web came from. So uh, if, you go to, if you Google for Extensible Web Manifesto, you'll find this website. Um, and uh, I'm one of the undersigned. And the basic idea of the Extensible Web Manifesto was we want to change the priorities of web standards. And in particular, we want to change them so that we can tighten that feedback loop between the editors of the web standards, the ones who are actually creating these standards, and the web developers who are the ones who are uh, the best uh, equipped to evaluate, um, to evaluate the work, and really should actually be directly involved in that work. So this is, this is where you come in. This is the part where um, I want to encourage web developers to take an active role in evolving the web. Historically, if you look at the conversations in standards, it's completely dominated by people who work for browser vendors, people like me. And there's a few hardy developers who are willing to weather the storm of shouting matches on mailing lists and, well, why didn't you read the last three years of back messages on this topic before you came in and, and asked that silly question that I've answered so many times before? Or you just don't understand what goes on in building a web browser, or you missed a security constraint. It's actually incredibly difficult 
to get up to speed on all of those things. So we want to get to a world uh, where there's more of a balance between browser vendors and web developers who are thinking about the web platform, who are designing the web platform, and evolving the web platform. And I don't have answers for all of this. I do see some culprits for what's not working. Um, in particular, after eight years in this business, I believe that mailing lists are a failed model of communication. I don't think that they work. Um, I also think that arguing on Twitter is a new failed model <laughs> of communication. I think that doesn't work either. I think Twitter does have its place. Uh, I've had a lot of good conversations where people just want a quick point of clarification. It's an easier way to get sort of a targeted answer to something. But as soon as people start disagreeing about something, it is a horrible place to continue a conversation. So I don't have all the answers. I do think an important piece of this puzzle is GitHub. I think that, uh, well, we're certainly seeing the W3C uh, and to some degree TC39, there's more coming, uh, moving more and more of their work to GitHub. And I think that's important. I think for one, just socially it's important. It's the world where web developers live. And that's where you, know, you need to come to the turf of the people that you want to engage with. Uh, but there's also some tools that I think work better. It allows you to focus conversations a little bit better by having individual GitHub issues instead of uh, endless uh, mailing list threads. It helps you focus a little bit. I certainly don't think GitHub issues are a panacea. I don't think they're perfect. Um, but I'm very much interested in improving the model of collaboration between uh, web, web uh, browser vendors and web developers. So I'd very much encourage anybody who's interested to talk to me and, and um, just have some conversations about ways that we can do this better. But I will say that there's something very concrete that I think all of you have the opportunity to do, and I think really does change the conversation. This is a phenomenon I've seen in the last couple of years, and that is to actually take part in building uh, polyfills, and the, the variation of polyfills is prolyfills, which is really probably the most relevant thing here. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the idea, polyfill is simply a shim. It's a library that implements a feature in case it's not there yet. Um, so it's filling a gap uh, in what's currently deployed by a particular version of a browser. A prolyfill is the same idea, except it's applied to a proposed library that hasn't yet been standardized. So if you want to sh demonstrate what a feature might look like, a feature that you're proposing, you can build a sort of candidate polyfill, and that's what people call prolyfills. Um, but the other half is building compilers. So if you're interested in new language features, you can build, uh, uh, you can either take one of the existing compilers, such as Google's Tracer, uh, or there's a handful of individual features for ES6 that are being built uh, as individual compilers. And over time, people are starting to figure out ways that they can put those together. So if you actually look at participating in those, you actually are becoming a kind of browser vendor of your own. You're basically becoming an implementer of a feature. And you will have a level of depth of insight that actually many of the browser vendors who haven't gone through the exercise of building the feature don't. And you will find that you're able to have very high value conversations with other people involved in standards. So I just want to give a couple of shout outs to people who have done a fantastic job of this so far, because I think they're models that we want to follow. So one of those is Ben Newman, who has built a tool called Regenerator, uh, which is an ES6 uh, generator compiler. Um, Another group of people, uh, I, I think three of the leaders of the project are, are Brian Donovan, Joe Liss, and Thomas Boyd, but there's actually 16 contributors listed on the, the GitHub repo. This is for the ES6 module transpiler. So these are people who are actually engaging with the standards uh, as they're going. They're, they're, they're working with us together as collaborators, and they're finding that in this process, they're actually getting brought into the conversation because they have as much or more valuable feedback to give as the people who are building the browsers. So the TLDR of the extensible web is if there are missing primitives in the platform, we've got to prioritize those first, because those primitives are what you use to build these polyfills, prolyfills, and compilers on top of them. And then from there, we enable evolution to happen out in user land. We enable evolution to happen in uh, uh, JavaScript implementations of language features, or sorry, of, of library features, or uh, pre-compilers that compile language features. And then we can work together, both browser vendors and uh, web developers to actually together design the web that we want to see. And that's all I have to say. Thanks very much.